please join me in giving a round of applause to Principal Chuck Flores. Good evening. How are we all doing today? Usually the same kind of conversation I have with my students when we meet here at the Coconut Grove, but I'd really like to welcome all of you to uh, Robert F. Kennedy Community School, and it's only fitting that we have Students First, the organization that's looking at reform in public education, uh, hosting the uh, California Mayor's Roundtable in Education at our site. We, being a public school in LA Unified School District, really strive for innovation, and we've really established that model here on our campus. As you may or may not know, we are a complex of six autonomous pilot schools that are really geared towards innovation, but really with the foundation of social justice. And given the fact that this was the site where Robert Kennedy was assassinated, that really informs who we are as a school and who our students are as citizens of Los Angeles, the nation, and the world. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've really put a program of uh, innovation together, whereby our teachers are really the leaders on our campus. I know what students first were looking at a different model in terms of education, and that's really taken root here on our campus. Uh, you have to understand the uh, dynamics of the school such as ours, whereby teachers are the leaders, whereby the instruction of the curriculum is really developed by teacher groups, and whereby that collaborative effort leads to student success. The six schools on our campus uh, encompass a wide variety and a range of different themes. Mine is the New Open World Academy, which is really focused on social justice and technology as well as environmental awareness. We have the LA High School of the Arts, a 912 uh, school. The School for Visual Arts and Humanities, another 912 school. UCLA Community School, which is a K-12 span, similar to the NOW Academy. The Ambassador School of Global Leadership, a 612 span school. And the Ambassador School of Global Education, an elementary school. But really, the uh, story here is not so much the complex, not so much the building that we're in, and not so much the teachers, it's about the students. And again, echoing the sentiment here, students first, this school was a long time coming for our community. Uh, historically, our students have been bused 20, 30 years uh, into, Los, into the various parts of Los Angeles, including the Valley, two, three hour bus rides. So students who live in this community across the street never were able to take advantage of the school within their boundaries, within their neighborhood. That changed with the opening of the Robert Kennedy Community School Complex. And our students have really taken root and have really striven to do their best. Uh, we're really proud of the fact that given that we are in, in the middle of a gang community, we are in the midst of a very impacted community, our students come out of campus and respect what it is to be a student, to be a citizen of Los Angeles and the world. Uh, that being said, our students are doing uh, rather well in terms of their education. We provided an awesome program of instruction for them. And again, the curriculum speaks an underlying theme of social justice, and I know we're all here for that same purpose. Uh, again, I'd like to welcome all of you here. Uh, Monica Garcia, our board president, is here as well. Uh, and at this time, I'd like to welcome uh, Superintendent Dr. John Daisy. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you very much. We are thrilled that you are here, and I am thrilled to be able to welcome students first here. We're glad you're here, and we're glad you're part of the transformation of not only LAUSD, but California. And it is very fitting um, that we're here. One of the, uh, the pieces that we took from this school was how the teachers themselves crafted these schools and had the autonomy and not only the courage, but the ability to do that. And that is what prompted uh, the negotiations to lead to the new contract. Um, in, Cal in uh, Los Angeles, where every school in Los Angeles has the opportunity to transform themselves into a school like the six autonomous schools here, with these autonomies and opportunities. And we're thrilled um, that that is able to be the case. We're not interested in taking as long as it took to build this building for the next set of reforms. <laughs> so pace um, is a full letter word um, in education. And when youth rights are at all imperiled or being held back, you bet pace is going to be at the center of the agenda about what we thought fully but quickly. I get the privilege of introducing a gentleman tonight um, that I hold in very, very high esteem. So I get the privilege of introducing Mayor Kevin Johnson, um, who is our mayor in 
Sacramento. So it goes without saying that his brilliance and agility and talent are so well known um, in his MBA career. Um, but what's rapidly becoming clear is that those talents are being equaled and eclipsed as his leadership as a mayor and educational issues um, and educational issues in California. And um, I'm proud that he is leading the mayor's roundtable for education in the state of California and that he is with us today. So it is my privilege to welcome uh, Mayor Kevin Johnson here to LA and leading us here in this conversation with Students First. Welcome, Mr. Mayor. Good to be in LA. When I used to play for the Phoenix Suns, I used to hate coming to LA. <laughs> <laughs> My record was like five and like 45. <laughs> so I do not have good memories in LA. Uh, it's awesome to be here uh, for such an important topic, education. All of you have come out, and we just thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank your superintendent, uh, John Dacey. You have an incredible leader here in this community. Give him another round of applause. Is, uh, is sponsored by both Students First, which I'll talk about in a second, as well as the California Mayor's Roundtable. And we have Paul Kohler with us, who runs the California Mayor's Roundtable. Paul, stand on up. Let's get Paul in. Uh, your dynamic principal, uh, I want to come out and hang out here. California Mayor's Roundtable, here's what we try to do. Mayors and superintendents talking about the importance of education in our respective cities. Mayors and superintendents saying there's nothing more important than education. As a mayor, you cannot have a great city without great schools. Impossible. California Mayor's Roundtable has 30 mayors from up and down the state that we get together and we talk about these issues. And we want to put them front and center. And I am so thankful to your mayor, Antonio Veragosa. He was here earlier, and he had to leave. And he had a message for the community here. He had to leave because President Obama is naming him chair of the Democratic Convention in Charlotte. So you need to be very thankful that your mayor is doing such a high honor and recognition. And when we tried to harass him about honoring his commitment, how do you say no when the president is in your city and demanding you to be somewhere else. Uh, but he did stop by briefly, and uh, he has been a partner in this movement of really pushing education forward. So I'm very thankful to the mayor and his staff. Um, we have a lot of elected officials here. Um, I don't want to mention them all. We have elected officials. We have school board members. We have superintendents. We have our educational partners. We have business community. We have civil rights organizations. Could you just please give them one big round of applause? So, just a couple quick data points. In California, and you guys have heard these numbers before, we have 11, 000, over 11,000 schools in California. 11,000. Over 6 million students in California. California educates one out of every eight children in this country. As California goes, the rest of the country goes. Unfortunately, California has went from first to worst. And that's part of what this dialogue is about here today. When you think about Los Angeles, and you have an unbelievable leader in, in Superintendent Dacey, Los Angeles has over 800 schools and over 700,000 kids in Los Angeles. Huge student population in our community. So let me just give you one data point. And this just puts it all in reality for me that if you look at our third graders in Los Angeles, only 39% of our third graders are reading at grade level in Los Angeles. That means 61% are not reading at grade level. That's just not acceptable. It's really not, and when you think about it. And raise your hand if you've heard of the API score, Academic Performance Index. Okay, almost everybody in the audience. You guys have heard about student achievement gap. Let me give you one statistic, that the API score for African Americans in Los Angeles is 678. The API score for Latinos is 707. 
and the API score for white children is 862. That's a student achievement gap. If you look at the last five years, that gap has only closed 17 points in a five year period. If we want to close the gap between white kids and African American or Latino kids, it's going to take 54 years to close the gap at the rate that we're going. I don't think any of us in here think that's a sense of urgency or quick enough. I don't think any of us would allow that to be the case for our children. So the good news is, Principal Flores, many examples in Los Angeles, other examples up and down the state, there are places where the achievement gap is not an issue because kids are actually doing well. You give them a high quality teacher, a committed principal, more time, all those things that you know about, our kids can learn. Don't let anybody convince you otherwise that because of the color of your skin or the zip code or the neighborhood that you live in, your lot in life is determined. No, it's determined by the access that you get to a high quality education. And that's what Students First believes, and that's them for the Students First. So what we did through the California Bears Roundtable is we're doing a listening tour. Students First is in 10 to 12 other states around the country, but they are not in California. How do they get invited in typically? A governor or somebody that's the head of the state legislature invites them in. Our governor hasn't invited Michelle into California yet. Nor has our, hey, hey, be nice, don't get me in trouble. So we have not been invited in to California yet. The good news is, Michelle has 150,000 Students First members here in California. 150,000. She has a million around the country, but the largest membership base is in California. In Los Angeles, you have 11,000 11, Students First members, and in LA County, you have 40,000. So this is the biggest group in the city and up and down the state, over 150,000. So what's going to get her to come to California and do work is you folks. If you as the membership community say, look, we want Students First to fight on behalf of our children in California, then your voices will be heard. She cannot deny that. The organization can't deny it. So we've chosen to do a listening tour in five cities. Sacramento, <laughs> the Bay Area, Fresno, San Diego, and Los Angeles. We've done a listening tour. We've done four. This is our fourth one. The fifth one will be up in the Bay Area next month. And we're asking you, what are the issues that are most important? What do you want to see happen? And there's been some common themes that have been occurring. So I won't even tell you what they are, because they'll come out in today's conversation. We want to make education a hip, cool topic. We want to make education a top priority in every city. And that's what I, as mayors and other mayors around the country, want to do. It is not a sexy topic. And a lot of times, you don't have bold superintendents that are willing to have real adult conversations. And at the end of the day, we have to put children first. So what we want to do, to be consistent with that, we have a nice little treat for you today, and then I'll introduce uh, the featured speaker. We have the Roosevelt High School drum line. And we're going to invite them up to just remind you that kids and students are first. So thank you very much. Give a round of applause for the drum line for Roosevelt High School.
guys get the second one before? I'm going to invite you guys to second one. We have a high school there that needs to be filled up with students. All right, so this is what you've all been waiting for. Raise your hand if you're a Students First member. Ooh, hey, 80% of the folks in here. Impressive. Raise your hand if you've seen Waiting for Superman. Hey, even more. Okay, all right, great, great. So what we're going to do, I'm going to invite Michelle up in a moment. She's going to make some brief remarks, and then we're going to open it up to Q&A, and then Michelle will address as many questions as we can. She'll make a closing remark, and then you can enjoy the rest of your evening. And remember, the president's in town, so the traffic isn't so good. You know, like, as if it ever. <laughs> so Michelle was born in Toledo. Uh, many of you may or may not know that. She went to Cornell, undergraduate. Um, got her master's at Harvard, and then joined an organization called Teach for America. She taught in Baltimore for three years, and then started an organization called the New Teacher Project. She ran that very successfully for 10 years, and then got a job in Washington, D.C. She was a chancellor of DCPS, and did such, good, she did such a good job there that they got rid of her and the mayor. <laughs> And I'm hoping this is not a trend. <laughs> but wherever she goes, the mayor get booted out of town. Um, she started this organization, Students First, because it, the name says it all. It's headquartered in Sacramento. I had a little bit to do with that. But as I said earlier, she has a million members, 150,000 that are in California. Uh, she has two beautiful children. And um, I just cannot say enough about her commitment, her passion her tenacity to just take on the status quo. This lady is not anti-anything. She's just pro-kids at the end of the day. And she wants every child in this country to have the same opportunities that her two children have. And she's not going to stop until that reality uh, occurs. Um, she's been called a lot of names. <laughs> Dragon lady. Teacher terminator. Hatchet woman. The bee eater. I'd like to introduce my wife. So, Really get to know what the people of Washington, D.C. wanted. 
when he was finally elected in a, in a landslide, what he said was that no matter what corner of the city he was in, the one thing that he kept hearing over and over and over again was you have to fix the schools. You have to fix the schools. And it was actually no wonder that people were saying that because at the time, in 2007, uh, let me just share with you a few statistics. But the district was known as, largely known as the most dysfunctional and lowest performing school district in the entire nation. It was a school district in which if you were a ninth grader entering into high school in our city, the probability that you would graduate from college was 9%. We had an achievement gap of where the white students were performing and where the African American students were performing of 70 percentage points. That's 70 zero, 70 percentage Of all of the eighth graders in the city schools, only 8% of them were able to do math on grade level, which means that 92% of our kids did not have the skills and knowledge necessary to be productive members of society. And potentially the most disheartening data of them all was about our little ones. And what that data said was that when our kids came into our schools and into our school district, they were about on par with kids who look like them in other urban jurisdictions across the, the, the country. So not with their suburban counterparts. They were actually, by the time they got to kindergarten, they were already far behind their suburban counterparts. But they were on par with kids who looked like them from other cities like Compton or Philadelphia, Detroit, across the nation. The problem was that the longer they stayed in our school system, the worse off they became. By the time they were in the third grade, they were far below their urban counterparts. And this is an interesting statistic, which is that the poor black fourth grade in New York City, we're operating two full grade levels ahead of the poor black fourth graders in Washington, D.C. So for everyone who wanted to blame the low academic achievement levels of our children on single parent families, on violence in the community, on a lack of health care or proper nutrition, the last time I checked, the poverty in Harlem was not that different from the poverty in Southeast Washington, D.C., but the kids in Harlem were two grade levels ahead of so that gives you a sense of the incredible depth of the problem. So that's what we inherited when the mayor took over control of the schools, and he decided uh, in 2007 on that first day to appoint me as the city's first schools chancellor. That went over just about as well as a led I mean, people were like, what, what, what? I was a 37-year-old Korean girl from Toledo, Ohio. Right. Yes, Korean people. Uh, <laughs> who had never run a school, much less a school district. And people were wondering, why does he think that she's the person who's going to be able to fix this mess? And so the, the, the overriding sentiment in the city at that time was, what on God's green earth is Adrian Fenty thinking? And that's pretty much what I was thinking for my first few days in office. As I was sitting there trying to figure out, what do you do when you trying to fix a system where nearly everything is broken. Where do you start? So I was actually fortunate enough that I had lots of people in the city who were very, very committed to education, who were very knowledgeable about what happened in the past and what they believe needs to happen in the future. And one of the things that they told me was, you have to figure out where all the money is. Because we were spending more money than almost any urban jurisdiction in the entire nation, but our results were at the absolute bottom. So when you went into our schools, you saw these decrepit buildings, you saw, we went into <coughs> classrooms where teachers had to spend their own money to buy basic supplies like paper and pencils and markers, where we didn't have art and music teachers. I mean, it literally did not feel to anyone in the system like we were one of the wealthiest school districts in the country. So it seems like an obvious place for me to start, right? Okay, find out where all the money is going. I'm just going to give you one example of, of, of sort of what happened along the way, what we found. Uh, I sent my staff out. I said, okay, you know, we spend a billion dollars on education in this city. Figure out where that money is going and, and, and you know, what kind of results it's producing. So after a few weeks, my, one of my special assistants came back to me and he said, okay, what I have found is very interesting. Now, in public education, interesting is a euphemism for, you know, I don't like it, right? 
So he says, what I find is very interesting. He said, um, I went and I did exactly what you said. I tried to figure out where all the money is going. I looked for the largest line items. And he said, and I have two interesting factoids for you. The first one is that we spend about $90 million a year paying to transport a few thousand special education kids through the system. So I do the quick back of the envelope math, and it turns out that it means that we're spending about $18,000 a year per kid on, on this transportation. And so I said, well, let me see. For $18,000 a year, you could buy the kid a Saturn <laughs> <laughs> and hire a personal chauffeur for the Saturn every year after that. I said, I do not know anything about running bus routes, but I am confident that I can do it for less than $18,000 a year. This is actually good news. Because what we're going to do is make the bus route more efficient, and then we're going to take the savings, and we're going to push it down to the classroom where it belongs. He said, it's actually not that easy. You see, the district did such a poor job in the past of making sure that our special needs kids were getting to where they needed to go, that now there's a court order, a consent decree against the district. And there's a court-appointed special master. And he is responsible for transportation now, and he's allowed to spend as much money as he wants. And all we can do is pay the bill at the end of the year. We have no ability to control costs. So I look at my assistant and I said, that is the craziest thing I have ever heard. And he looks at me and he said, that's because you haven't heard my second. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'm trying to figure out where are all these kids going? The city is only but a few square miles wide. And if the bus is doing circles all day long, it should not cost $18,000 what is going on? He said, what I realized is that not only were we doing a poor job of transporting the kids to school, but once they got to school, we were not providing them with the services and the resources that they needed to be successful. So what happened was there was this culture that was created where the parents were at their wit's end. The only thing that they felt like they could do in order to get their kids what they deserve is to sue the district. We would then routinely lose the lawsuit because they were right and we were wrong. And what would happen as a remedy is the courts would allow these kids to get sent to private schools and the district had to pay the tuition. And I thought, I've never heard of such a thing. The public schools have to pay the private school tuition. This is crazy. He said, let me just give you an example of how this happened. He said, I found an employee, just a mid-level employee in our district, said in one week she made two mistakes. With one kid, she didn't fill out a form she was supposed to fill out. And with another kid, she didn't have a meeting she was supposed to have. And in both of these cases, it resulted in these children getting sent to a private institution that cost this district $227,000 per year per child. So I said, OK, I'm going to have to leave this lady. So my assistant calls the lady and says, ma'am, we need you to come to a meeting at the chancellor's office tomorrow at 5 o'clock. So she says, well, I'm going to have to check with my supervisor. My sister said, ma'am, the chancellor is your supervisor. <laughs> She's everyone's supervisor. The woman says, well, fine, I'll come back. I'm going to bring my lawyer with me. He said, bring whoever you have to bring this show at 5 o'clock. So the next day, I walk into the conference room, and there she is. I said, I understand you had a question about whether or not you should, should come to this meeting. She said, no, 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 no. I was just a little freaked out. I'm good now. I'm here. <laughs> you know, I said, OK. So I pull out the files. I said, this kid, you didn't fill out the form. This kid, you didn't have the meeting. I said, with two mistakes. You cost this district nearly half a million dollars. Help me understand how that happened. So she looks at me and she says, well, you need to understand that I am a very busy person. I have a lot of meetings to go to. I have a lot of forms I have to fill out. I have a lot of kids on my kids. So things are going to fall through the cracks. That's just the way that it is. And I looked at her and I said, no, you need to understand that if you believe this job is too big for you, then you need to go find another job. I said, but if you are going to take the paycheck home every other week, then you have to take personal responsibility for doing everything within your job for you and doing it well. And she looked at me and she said, but that's not fair. <laughs> I said, I kid you not. This is the kind of a uh, 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 sort of conversation I had over and over and over again with people throughout the district. People who, who came to work every day, punched in, punched out, made a good living, 
but who had absolutely no understanding of the fact that the job that they were supposed to do every day was to serve our children, our teachers, and our school. That's the only reason why you're there. So when you think about the, the environment that was created, we're spending all this money, the kids are absolutely languishing in these schools and the classrooms that are not preparing them for the future. So if you ask me why I'm angry, and you ask me why I'm so confrontational, it's because the children of this country are being done a disservice every single day. Every single day they are being subjected to a subpar education because we as the adults in the system cannot get ourselves together. And if you think for one minute, change any time in the near future, or that it's going to change through hugging people and singing kumbaya <laughs> together, you could not be more wrong. Because the system did not become the way that it is by accident. There are people, there are companies, there are law, there are people everywhere who benefit from the dysfunction. And so the only way that we're going to change this and put it on a different trajectory is if everybody in this room gets a little angrier and a little bit more confrontational. But in my mind, there is absolutely nothing that is more worth fighting for and getting a little belligerent about than the future of the children in this country. Right? All right, so as we get started here, who thinks that education is a civil rights issue of our time. Paul, come on out here. Come on out. Paul, walk out a little bit. So we intentionally had this gathering here because the school, the Robert F. Kennedy School, what better family name that represents the fight of the civil rights movement than the Kennedy family? Back, raise your hand. Paul Charette, he led the movement over 23 years to make this school a reality, and the library is named after him. Let's just give him a round. <laughs> All right, so if you have your model for carrying on Robert Kennedy's legacy, that's what you're doing here now, and that's what the school is all about. Amen. <laughs> Question, raise your hand. We'll get through as many as we can. We'll start over here. Yes. Hi, I'm a teacher in Orange County, and I was just ambivalent in regards to my thoughts of tenure. There's a lot of teachers that I learned from um, who have been there for a while, and I was just wondering what your thoughts were in terms of reforming tenure, because I feel like some of the teachers, in terms of their patterns of teaching and their expectations for what they deserve versus their output for the children's education, in my opinion, doesn't go hand in hand. So what is your thoughts on reforming tenure in terms of your influence in D.C. and with your new program of Students First across the country? It didn't take long for this show to get started. <laughs> <laughs> If you, if you look at the past and the history around why tenure came into existence, uh, especially in, in, in public education, it was actually for very good reasons, right? So women and teachers were being treated, uh, uh, you know, being discriminated against in terms of their pay and their hours and their working conditions, etc. Uh, and so they, you know, they wanted to create a system where essentially you could not have sort of arbitrary and capricious actions, etc. Um, I think that we are in a very, very different time. Right? We have federal protections that uh, ensure that, that people are treated fairly. Um, and I think the most important thing for the effective teachers that I talk to, I, teach, I talk to teachers every single day, literally, they're less concerned about tenure. They just want to know that they are going to be treated in a fair and transparent way. That, as long as they have that, they're actually fine. Uh, but what tenure has become in our country is something that it was both never intended to do and I think is, is a detriment overall, which means, which, which is that it essentially means that a teacher, once you have gained tenure, have a job for life regardless. Right. 
And uh, in my opinion, we don't have room for anything in education unless it actually benefits student achievement, right? And there's no tie, there's no absolutely no relationship or correlation between having tenure and having better student outcomes. So my, my overall thought on this is that if anyone is due protections in our school system, it has to be the children, not the adults. My name is Elizabeth, and I have worked um, as a traditional public school teacher, as a charter school teacher, and I've seen how charters come into communities, give families and communities a great option, um, but then also sometimes they come into communities and set up false expectations. So I would love to hear your thoughts on school choice, charters, and accountability. Okay, if I can't answer that question, I think they're all dying. <laughs> school choice, charters, charters, accountability. I mean, here's, here's the, the bottom line. As students, first, we strongly believe that every family, regardless of where they live and what their income level is, deserve to have uh, a, a number of high quality school options for their children. We should never have families in a situation where they feel like they're trapped in a failing school. And I can tell you right now that there are so many families who that is the reality for. And I, and I talk to a lot of families who actually, you know, middle and upper middle class families, who say, I wouldn't prefer to send my child to the neighborhood public schools. That is my that is my first choice. But I just don't feel like I can risk it because of, of, of what's going on in our school district. So choice, we have choice everywhere in life. You go to the store and you have 52 choices of diet, iced tea, and, and, and tennis shoes and this sort of thing. Why shouldn't we have choice for families in education as well? Um, I, I will say this about, about charter schools. I, 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 people say, well, do you think charter schools are the answer to the vouchers and all this stuff? That's actually not accurate. What I'm about is great schools. If you're in a great school, I don't, care what, I don't care if you're a public charter school, I don't care if you're a traditional public school, I don't care if you're a private school. If you are doing good things for kids, then I am for you. And I think part of the challenge that we face is that there's this uh, dynamic where people are saying, well, charter schools are great, or charter schools are evil, and like, you know, that sort of thing. And if we actually took the, the emphasis away from what kind of school it is, and put it on, is it an effective school, and is it serving kids well, then I think we'd all be much, much better off as a society. I've been a public school teacher in Compton for the last four years. Every year since then, I've received a pink slip, and finally last year, I was laid off due to last in, first out policy. Knowing that those policies still exist, what would you say, what kind of message would you give to students in college or people looking to make a career move who want to become teachers? So this is part of the reason why it is, it is so difficult to recruit top talent into this profession. Because even when you have great young people who are incredibly uh, uh, you know, enthusiastic and have tremendous potential, you're asking them to come into a profession where from the get-go we are saying, we will not value you for your performance whatsoever. We are going to make decisions about your employment based on how long you have been there. So I was actually in Philadelphia not too long ago, and I was talking to a teacher who also was was lamented about last night for a death. She told me a story about how on her first day of school teaching, she carpooled to school with a fellow teacher. They would their breath start their first day uh, as teachers together at this school. Um, she had to park the car, so this guy went in, signed in before her, one line before her, two minutes. And when the layoff notices came, she got laid off and he didn't because he had more seniority. <laughs> two minutes more. Last and first out policies are incredibly detrimental to children and to schools in three ways. One, you end up laying off some of your best teachers in the district when you don't take any account of how, how much value a teacher is adding. So you, you have, and I'm not saying that all new teachers are great. Some new teachers are happy, some veteran teachers are. I mean, you know, what we should be looking at is not how long someone's taught, but how, how effective they are. So we end up losing some of our most effective teachers. That's the first reason why. 
The second reason why this, this is a detrimental policy is because you actually end up having to lay off more people because the junior teachers are paid the least amount of money. So to build, you know, to, to, to make up the, the budget deficit, you actually have to lay off more teachers and therefore disrupt more classrooms. The research shows that if, you, if a district were to do layoffs based on quality instead of seniority, they could save about 30% of the jobs. And the last is that it disproportionately negatively impacts the lowest performing and highest need schools in a district. Because you have some parts of town where you've got a, you know, an affluent community, you have a very high functioning school. Once people go to that school, they never want to leave, so that school may not have any new teachers. And you might have a school in the core of the inner city where there's teacher turnover every year. 50% of the staff is new, and so that school is decimated by the budget cuts, and this other school is held harmless. That doesn't make any sense for kids, for our educational system. And, and let me tell you that California is one of the few states left that mandates within state law that layoffs happen in this way. So if you are wondering why school districts do this, at this point, that is the law in this state. And so if we want to be able to do something about last and first outbound policies and a lot of other things that are happening that don't make any sense to you as community members and parents and teachers, then what we're going to have to do is get politically active. So we're going to go, Nithya, uh, and then we'll go back really quickly. We have 300,000 teachers in California. We don't use data effectively, so we can't tell who the good teachers are and who the not so good teachers are. What you would typically want is to look at data and say, hey, here's your top 10% of teachers, 30,000 of them. Let's have them, let's pay them a little more and reward them, but let's also have them mentor maybe the bottom 10%. That's called professional development. We can't even tell who's who in California, and that's a disgrace to teachers as well as our, our students. Yes, my name is Lydia Grant, and I have a question. What suggestions would you have for a city like Los Angeles that's failing our children as badly as it is when the district blames the parents and the teachers and the community and the students instead of taking responsibility? What would you suggest for us? <clears throat> so this is a tough question, and I, and I get this a lot. People say, well, uh, I've heard people say, if we had better parents, then we have better kids, and then we have better schools. Uh, and, you know, here's the, the bottom line is that the research does show that when you have more parental in, involvement and engagement in school, that, that actually student achievement levels are high. So we should be doing everything that we can possibly do to, to encourage more parental involvement. But I'll tell you this, so I, uh, during my first couple of weeks in office, I was visiting schools and I visited this one school in particular, I walk into the front office and the woman who's sort of manning the office is chatting on the phone to her friend. She's pouring herself a cup of coffee. She's playing a little Tetris on her computer. <laughs> About 10 to 15 minutes later, she finally looks up and says, yeah. And I was the chancellor. I'm, I'm running the school district. If I figure, if this is the way I get treated, I can only imagine what happens when a parent walks in the door. We had parents all the time say to me, oh, well, um, I, I, if we have a rule at our school where we're not allowed to go uh, into class and into classrooms, or we have to drop our kids off at this yellow line that is like 25 yards away, you, you, can't, you can't have it both ways. You can't say that we want parental involvement and then actually do things that discourage parents from, from getting involved. So I think that um, what we have to do is ensure that the systems first, the school systems, the districts, are creating an environment where we're actually welcoming parents into the schools, where they feel like they're going to be respected for what they have to say. And then once we can establish that, that people understand that we want your involvement in the schools and we're not going to choose how exactly you get involved, then I think that's where we can sort of, you know, you know <coughs> sort of say, here are the requirements that we have for parental involvement, et cetera. But, but as it stands now, I just see a whole lot of parents who are being discouraged from being more involved in their schools. And that's a dynamic that we have to change. My name is Karen, and I stand up for all the children that are being bullied. But 
highest rate of suicide in this country is teens. Um, it is an epidemic. It is a crisis. It's the elephant in the room. And while we talk about education, we have children that are frightened and terrified to even go to school. We just lost a child at Lockwood Santa High School. His name was Drew. Okay? Friday. Then we lost a 12-year-old on Sunday. Okay? I stand here before all of you and beg you to do something about the suicide of our children. I represent bullying is for losers, and I welcome all of you to join this fight. And tell me, what are you doing to implement an anti-bullying policy in your school? Bullying is for losers. Very clear. Um, you know, I'll just give you one example. Uh, we we were hearing a lot in D.C. about similar issues, and in particular, uh, I visited with a group of students one in my first year when I got there, uh, who were a group of, of GLBTQ youth, and what they were saying was that essentially they didn't feel safe going into school every day. The the, the bullying was just so intense that they didn't know, uh, they had to sort of navigate their way around or purposefully come late to school so they didn't have to face, you know, big crowds of kids before they walked in. And as we were sort of unpacking this dynamic, what became, you know, very, very clear to us was that part of the problem, not all of the problem, but part of the problem that we faced was actually with our adults. Because we had a lot of adults who were working in the system who had sort of conflicted feelings. About, about GLBT kids sort of being out in and, and, and high school and, you know, sort of like all these factors kind of going in and sort of running through their minds. And so what these, some of these folks, uh, I think they did not realize was that by not actually taking a proactive stand and when they saw that kind of bullying of these children happening, not saying that is not acceptable, they just thought about, well, I'm not doing it, then I'm okay. But in fact, if you are letting it happen, if you're hearing about it and you're not doing something about it, then you are in part, you know, playing a role in that. And so what we realized we'd have to do was to do a, a, a lot of training of our adults in how to work through their personal issues and feelings about it, but also how to ensure that they were creating the kind of environments where people, all the other children understood that this kind of sort of name calling center was not going to be tolerated. So we'll have to work on the front end to do that kind of training. Thank you for that. And Matt? Yeah, my name is Lauren. I work in adult ed. I work with the adults at uh, Dr. Nava uh, Learning Complex in South LA. You pretty much addressed the question, but in what ways would you suggest specifically you could uh, um, include the adults in a meaningful way, the parents, in uh, the, the learning process of the students? Because the fact is, for a lot of the students that are the most low, low performing, uh, their parents just don't show up, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, it's interesting. Um, if you look over the last 18 to 24 months in this country, we have had three very high profile uh, dealings with, with parents and schools across the country. So uh, in, in the first, uh, we had uh, a, you know, the, the Waiting for Superman movie, which sort of showcased five families throughout the country who were fighting to get their kids into a decent school. The second was actually right here uh, in Compton, California, where a group of parents, led by Parent Revolution, I know that is there, uh, to, to be the first group of parents who pulled the parent trigger, uh, signed the petition to turn their school around, and then the last was a parent, a mother in Akron, Ohio, who falsified her residency documents to try to get her kids to be able to attend a higher performing safer school. So let's look for a moment at how we treated those three groups of parents. The first group of parents were told, I'm sorry, there is no room for your children at these higher performing schools. You're stuck. In the second circumstance, these parents were harassed. They were threatened with deportation. I mean, everything under the sun. And in the third circumstance, we threw the lady in jail. So I do not think we are sending the message to parents of America that we want their involvement in the schools. That's the first thing. The second thing is, and, and this is what it comes down to ultimately, is are we, the question that we have to answer as a society, 
Are we going to hold children responsible for something that they have absolutely no control over, which is what their parents decide to do or not do? Because if we're saying at the front end that unless you, your parent, comes in and comes to the conference and fills out the form and all these things, if, if your parents don't do that, then we're allowed to advocate responsibility for your education. Then we might be telling a whole lot of kids all throughout the millions of kids throughout this country that you need to stay home because because your mom is not going to do this and so we're you don't you don't stand a fight you can't. Are, are we willing as a nation to subject children to a subpar education over something that their parents are either going to do or not do? I, I would I would say that as a country we simply cannot do that. So can we encourage more parental involvement? Absolutely. Can we hold kids accountable and responsible for that? Absolutely not. I think it's up to us. I think clearly the message is we need both to happen, right? They're not mutually exclusive. And I know we have some members there. Ben, stand up real quick from, from uh, Parent Revolution. <laughs> we have members here from Families That Can. Are they here? So there's so many of you that are doing all you can to create an environment where parents can be fully engaged, and we're very thankful for that. We'll go in the back. Yes. Hi, my name is Laura Fuller Shaw. I was actually a therapist in the West Covina Public School District for some time, and left that to run a private Montessori school um, because Montessori is an environment where students really do come first. And I'm looking at your tagline, and I think, of course I'm getting old, so I can't really see, but it says a movement to transform public education. And I guess my question is, our public education system is based on a model of factory efficiency. It's not actually based on the development of people. So what are we going to do about that? Because it's unfair that children can attend private Montessori schools a system that actually starts at birth and goes all the way through high school that is actually based on development of children and that it's not something that is offered. Even public Montessori charter schools can't really do what they do best because of the state that the state doesn't recognize that kindergartners should be with three to six year olds, yeah. these sorts of things. So Part of it is about breaking out the mold of the public education bureaucracy. I mean, people have this belief, people work in school districts, right? They're not bad people, but they have these certain belief sets. And if you don't fit into the box, you know, that they can check, uh, then they don't know what to do. Uh, let me share with you an experience that we had specifically with Montessori schools in D.C. We had uh, one specific program in the city, Montessori program, very high quality program, and the uh, number of families who applied every year to get their kids into this program, literally thousands. This is a district that was losing enrollment every year because people didn't have faith and confidence in our school district, and then you have this program where thousands of people are applying to come, and we didn't have enough spaces to actually accommodate them. So I said, duh. Let's build more of these Montessori programs, right? If this, is, if this is what parents want, then why should we give them more of that? The biggest challenge that we faced in doing that was that in order to set up a Montessori program, it required a significant initial investment for both the right materials and the proper training and hiring of the staff. And people said, well, we don't have any money because look, we're losing all these kids. So we don't have the money to put into it, but the program is much Montessori. What they didn't realize was, unless we innovate, and unless we start providing the city with the kinds of programs that their kids, they want their kids to attend, then, then this cycle is going to continue on and on and on. So we actually started a few uh, Montessori, new Montessori programs. We put the initial investment in, and you know what? Almost immediately, it started to pay for itself and more because we were actually able to provide more families with it, what they wanted there for lower enrollment. So I think part of the issue is that oftentimes people are very short-sighted, right? If it costs us money and we don't have the money, then we can't do it. Instead of seeing a longer-term 
uh, you know, gate to say, yes, we have to make an initial investment now, but it's going to benefit our, our system in the long run. That's, that, that's some of the kind of thinking that needs to change. Right. Well, so we're running out of time. Let's get, I'd like to hear the question and then hear the question. Let Michelle address those last two questions and then we're going to close it out. So question and question before she answers. Uh, I'd like to know, you. Um, I agree with you wholeheartedly about the involvement of parents and the advocacy of parents for their child. However, what did you find in your um, work in Washington and uh, currently as you're looking at uh, solutions to the problem with education as so far as relationships between administration and teachers whom say were undesirables, the pollutants in the education system. Did you find that relationships also led to a lot of your struggles with trying to create you know, solutions to your problem? And the other part of that is parents who want to advocate find that it's such a high risk for retaliation against their child, particularly if they're happy, as to whether or not that's going to contaminate their efforts and their opportunities. In the school, uh, yeah, I uh, May I thank Jensen? I like you because uh, <laughs> <laughs> in a basketball, on this level, complete coordination, the unity among the team, they cannot be champion, right? Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. In a tribute to Mission William, uh, <laughs> I wish! <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I'm from Korea, so if I may take a 30 seconds in a tribute to Michelle Rui. No time ago in Korea, there's a young, handsome, rich, smart guy who went to the greatest educator. I told him, I want to become somebody you cannot be, become. You know? And a, a great educator, philosopher said, wait a minute, you want to be somebody I couldn't have become? Yeah, tell me, I'm so good, I can be anybody. And a teacher thought, oh, I'm a sort of an elementary school teacher. And a great educator said, you know, elementary school teacher. And a young man said, oh, come on, anybody.